Welcome, everyone. I'm happy to see all of you and to be able to open the fall semester together with today's conversation on the question of repair. Welcome to Site and History, the first in a series of discussions that will continue throughout the academic year as part of our collective efforts to acknowledge and uncover the history of Columbia University's colonialist and discriminatory practices against Black, Indigenous, and people of color. In the past years, and especially this past summer, powerful voices around the country have risen to call on institutions to acknowledge the systemic racism that lies deep in their foundations and has enabled their edification. Calling for a focus on these institutions' reliance on slavery to the support and promotion of racist discourses and practices, this emphasis is rightfully appending the bucolic image of the American campus as a kind of mythical knowledge paradise suspended outside political histories of violence to reveal instead how these seats of power have and continue to be intimately connected with the violence they often prefer to undo. This violence is inscribed across university campus sites, buildings, monuments, and the plaques that often accompany them, rendering architecture and planning at the heart of what is erected and made visible and what is forgotten or erased. Witness in particular this summer's incredible convergence of the Black Lives Matter protests, bringing powerful life and solidarity into public spaces and streets across cities in the US, or the removal of Woodrow Wilson's name from Princeton University's Public Policy School and Wilson College, or the inscribing of over 4,000 memory marks on the curvilinear wall of the recently completed Memorial to Enslaved Laborers at the University of Virginia in Charlotte Charlottesville, in honor of the enslaved people who lived and worked at UVA between 1817 and 1865. Designed by Mijin Yoon and Eric Howler in collaboration with Mabel Wilson and many other voices, some of whom will come together here at GSAP on October 8th to share more about this incredible journey of the making of the project. The memorial is a reminder of architecture's ability to make potent arguments and to begin to address historical and present wrongs. I also want to acknowledge that today is September 11, a day inscribed in our collective trauma memory, as we remember the tragic attacks and the loss of life that happened 19 years ago. We are also reminded of how in the aftermath of 9-11, architecture was collectively mobilized and seen as a symbolic power with the potential to produce meaning and clarity. Today, we turn to Columbia University to understand the work underway here, to uncover our campus's own history of violence, from how it came to occupy its current site in Manhattan and its relationship with the communities of Harlem, Manhattanville, and Morningside Heights, to beginning to understand in what ways we, as architects, preservationists, planners, critics, and developers, can, contrib can contribute to a process of repair. In 2016, GSAP and its publication, Arm Seaback, published a book on Manhattanville's making, giving space to the many voices that came into its process and development. This is a subject that needs to continue to be explored. But today we will focus on the main Morningside campus and its immediate surroundings from the university's founding to the turn of the 21st century. To fully consider this deep history, I begin this conversation with an acknowledgement of the Lenape. Though we are dispersed virtually today, we gather in Lenape Hoking, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, their traditional territory, elders, ancestors, and future generations, and, acknowledge, and in acknowledging as a school that Columbia, like New York City and the United States as a nation, was founded upon the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples. GSAP is committed to addressing the deep history of erasure of indigenous knowledge in the professions of the built environment gen generally and in the Western tradition of architectural education specifically. So today, to open up this very sort of important conversation, I'm very excited to be welcoming such distinguished speakers uh, with whom we could spend the entire afternoon. And uh, we certainly are going to spend part of 
uh, the afternoon. Their buyers are too long uh, almost to kind of could occupy the entire afternoon, but um, I will introduce uh, each of them briefly in order of the presentations. And I should say that we're thrilled and proud to report that each presenter, as well as the moderator, is a graduate of Columbia, half of them from GSAP. This connection with the campus and the university felt really crucial to us in organizing this first launch discussion. Erica Avrami is the James Marston Fitch Assistant Professor of Historic Preservation at GSAP and an alumna of the program. She's currently editing the third volume of the Issues in Preservation Trilogy, which includes preservation and social inclusion, preservation and the new data landscape, and um, she is currently co-writing the article Confronting Exclusion, Redefining the Intended Outcomes of Historic Preservation. Um, sorry, she's not currently. It was written, which, which was published in the journal Change Over Time in 2018. Eric Foner is the DeWitt Clinton Professor Emeritus of History at Columbia University and is one of this country's most prominent historians. He received his doctoral degree at Columbia under the supervision of Richard Hochstatter. He's one of only two persons to serve as president of the three major professional organizations, the Organization of American Historians, American Historical Association, and Society of American Historians, and one of a handful to have won the Bancroft and Pulitzer Prizes in the same year. He's the faculty sponsor of the Columbia University and Slavery Project and the chief historical advisor for the award-winning PBS documentary series on Reconstruction and its aftermath broadcast in 2019. Mark Barksdale is a Columbia GSAP alumnus, licensed architect, licensed professional planner and graduate attorney. He served as the Director of Planning, Zoning, and Sustainability of the City of Newark from 2015 to 2017. He has also worked as Senior Architect at Metropolitan Hospital Center in Manhattan and as a Health Facilities Planner for the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation. As a college student, he interned with the Harlem Office of the New York City Department of City Planning and for local community organizations such as the Architects Renewal Committee in Harlem and the Harlem East Harlem Model Cities Development Program on planning projects for the Harlem, Harlem community with firms including uh, IMP and Partners, as well as Roberta Washington Architects, amongst others. Mindy Thompson Fullilove is a professor of urban policy and health at the New School. Prior to joining the New School in 2016, she worked for 26 years as a research psychiatrist at the New York State Psychiatric Institute and was a professor of clinical psychiatry and public health at Colum Columbia University, where she also studied. Her research examines the mental health effects of environmental processes such as violence, segregation, and urban renewal. Her more, most recent books are Main Street, How a City's Heart Connects Us All, and From Enforcers to Guardians, a public health primer on ending police violence with Hannah Cooper, both out this year. She is also the author of Rude Chalk, How Tearing Up City Neighborhoods Hurt, Hurts America and What We Can Do About It, published in 2016, when she was named an honorary member of the AIA for, I quote, advancing architecture and urban planning through her expansive knowledge of cities and the relationship between the built environment and the wellness of society. And last but not least, the panel will be moderated by Galia Solomonov, uh, who is an associate professor at GSAP, is an alumna of the architecture program and member of the university's global initiatives. Throughout, throughout her work, Galia, enga Galia engages in discussions of art, architecture, and how to further their public democratic mission in the cultural and political sphere. She designed too many beautiful projects to name today, but including much work with the Jewish Mu Museum uh, and the Dia Center, amongst other. And it is now my pleasure to introduce and invite Erica Avrami to present and frame the conversation. Thank you all for joining today. Thank you very much, Amal. Thank you for all of the colleagues at GSAP who helped to make this possible. I'm going to share my screen and put up some slides to share um, so that while I'm speaking, you don't have to just look at me. Um, and it also will give you a sense of the work that I'm trying to represent. OK. 
Can everyone see my screen? Yes, okay. So I, I wanna make a few comments before I speak about uh, uh, this work. First, I wanna challenge common perceptions about the work of historic preservation. Many see preservationists as saving old buildings um, and places of significance. However, preservation is fundamentally about interrogating the layered histories of the built environment to understand spatial conditions over time and the social, political, environmental, and economic forces that shaped them. In that sense, the built environment is not simply a visual or physical representation of stories and publics and power, but a spatial experience of them. We encounter histories and stories in the built environment. We don't just read them or see them. And this underpins the work of the studio I'm about to present and the historic preservation program writ large um, within um, the, the uh, GSAP community. Secondly, I want to acknowledge that this is not my work. This is just a fraction of the work of 25 historic preservation students um, in their spring 2019 studio. Uh, I coordinated the studio and co-taught it with professors Tim McGill, Belmont Freeman, and Andrew Dolcart, and we had tremendous support from other faculty and staff within Columbia and members of the Morningside Heights and Man Manhattanville communities. Thirdly, I, I want to be clear about who I am and, and my positionality. I'm a product of Columbia. I'm a graduate not only of GSAP, but also of Columbia College. Um, I'm also its employee. In that sense, I am both privileged and biased by not only the education and opportunities that the institution affords me, but by my whiteness. Um, but I developed this studio and asked students to think critically about Columbia's past and creatively about its future because I believe that this kind of deep interrogation of the past and a reckoning with its implications can lead us to a more just institution and a more just spatial environment. So most of you probably know that uh, the occupation of Morningside Heights by institutions. Um, the Dean has already spoken about um, the fact that we are as an institution on what were traditionally Lenape lands, unceded Lenape lands. Um, but one institution started to take root within the Morningside Plateau. New York Hospital's Bloomingdale Asylum was the first to establish a space and claim space in Morningside Heights. St. John the Divine followed, St. Luke's Hospital, Riverside Church was part of those early institutions establishing and claiming space within Morningside Heights. And of course, Columbia University, this is the rendering of McKim uh, Meeting White's master plan. Um, Columbia was moving its campus from downtown. Uh, it made the decision in 1893 to move to this northern area of Morningside Heights. Um, and it originally purchased the property between 116th and 120th Street. And actually um, in the foreground of this image, you can see remnants of the Bloomingdale Asylum. As the population of the area grew with the institutional development as well as industrial development to the north in Manhattanville, so did the built environment and so did the footprint um, of the built environment. We see the IRT coming in in 1904 um, and, and, and the institutions continued to grow around that rail line. We also saw an expansion of residential properties within the neighborhood. On the left, you can see 1905, just a few residential buildings. By 1916 on the right, we've seen a significant expansion of residential properties in the area. Now, as institutions developed in size and prestige in the next decades, more students and faculty were attracted to the area. Uh, And you can see here on the right, 
a list of the primary institutions um, that were occupying space uh, around 1920. These institutions went on to form an organization called Morningside Heights Incorporated, whose mission was a long range, imaginative and bold plan for community development uh, that would be organized. The community would be spiritual, cultural, and an intellectual center of the world. Um, and so began this collaboration, uh, this somewhat complicit collaboration to valorize the role of institutions within the Morningside Heights area uh, so as to ensure the development and the ongoing um, uh, development of these institutions for their educational, spiritual, and cultural purposes. Um, in this process, you know, they further solidified the idea of the Acropolis. Um, and it was in fact uh, when St. John the Divine was being developed that this Morningside Heights area first got coined as the Acropolis. Um, and in doing so, Morningside Heights Incorporated took on a number of public endeavors to create public housing um, through partnerships, um, but also in doing the survey work and doing the legwork on the ground to determine where housing might go. As a result, between 1950 um, and uh, the current day, we saw a significant expansion, not only of the footprint of those institutions, but also of New York City Housing Authority um, buildings. You see on the left here, um, the tenements that were removed in order to construct Morningside Gardens. We also see in the construction of the law school and Revson Plaza, which reaches over Amsterdam Avenue, the way in which uh, the campus was also moving to the east. Mark will be talking a little bit more about how the university attempted to move even further east with uh, the construction or the proposed construction of a gym in Morningside Park. And you see here today, or at least last year, this is now the footprint of those institutions in the Morningside Heights community. And you can see the way in which they have shaped um, uh, the landscape, shaped our physical experience, but also potentially displaced so many communities. And in fact, there was a tremendous amount of institutional agency, agency and influence in displacing communities. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Morningside Hearts Incorpor Incorporated was actually doing surveys, going out and doing mini census work to identify who lived in the neighborhood, what their ethnic and racial characteristics were. Um, they were also determining what was blight or what they considered to be blight by doing physical surveys of buildings and uh, attempting to identify what might be uh, in a good position for redevelopment. Um, they planned family relocations, uh, which of course eventually led to displacement, particularly of, of, of communities of color, northwards and eastwards. We saw an increase in income levels, education levels, et cetera, in the areas immediately surrounding um, the, the Morningside Heights campus. Um, and the media was complicit in this. Um, not only was Morningside Heights Incorporated pushing this, they were working in partnership with the New York City government, but the media helped frame a discourse around this idea of blight and the need for urban renewal. And this was happening throughout New York City and throughout cities across the United States. So Columbia and the Morningside Heights community were not alone in this. Um, but it's important to recognize the way in which that dialogue and the use of words like human wasteland um, contributed to rationales for continuing to develop and displace. 
Um, of course, there was backlash and communities tried to push back against this. Um, the Committee to Save Our Homes was an important player in all of that. You can see some of their, their letters and, and pamphlets. Um, and fundamentally, it created a tremendous amount of distrust between Columbia as an institution and the community who lived around that institution. Um, Columbia was a builder. It was claiming a lot of space. And even within the Morningside Heights Incorporated Coalition, Columbia was the most significant player. And in addition to claiming space and displacing people, um, part of what was happening over the course of the 20th century um, was Columbia was fortifying itself against that community as well, physically fortifying itself against that community. Here you see an early image of the way in which Low Library looked out upon the city and the openness around that. But if you look over time, you can see that the campus fortified itself. It built walls, not only through buildings, uh, and the way in which people experienced the perimeter of the campus um, uh, as pedestrians, but also more purposefully in the expansion, as I mentioned earlier, of the law school to um, the east and the creation of Refson Plaza, there was a particular um, dialogue about trying to separate the campus more from the community. The idea was that um, you know, this would be an isolated space for contemplative learning. Uh, and the more that we could separate uh, these buildings and these places from the noise and the busyness of the surrounding community, the better the institution would be. And that rhetoric played out in the way in which the law school, for example, has no sort of way of, of of looking inside it at that base level, at that sidewalk level. Um, and for anyone who's been under Revson Plaza, we know that it's um, a rather frightening tunnel. In addition, there were gates. And for those of you who are under the impression that the gates that now cover uh, those entryways on 116th Street on both Broadway and Amsterdam, that they were part of the original McKim, Mead, and White um, plan, they were not. And in fact, they were not proposed until the time of the creation of the law school in the 1950s. Before, as you can see here in the 1930s, it was an open street. The street got closed first to public traffic, basically to, to car traffic. Um, we see this design by Harrison and Abramovitz in, in 1957, again, while uh, the, the development work is happening for East Campus. And then we see the gates come in in 1970. Um, and there was clear rhetoric, as you saw from the earlier um, image that I had up, about maintaining security. Now, all of that, you know, really leads us to believe that there was a lot of intentionality on the part of the university to separate its students, its faculty, its community from the rest of the community. At the same time, I believe that there was so much happening within this institution and particularly during multiple um, examples of protests over Columbia's history. Um, and in fact, something that the students found as they dug deeply into this history was that the campus space, although it may be exclusionary, although it may have created barriers, although it may have claimed space and displaced communities, and it must be held accountable in some way for that, it also created space that afforded opportunities for speaking truth to power. And in some ways, what we then challenged our students to do was think about that idea of speaking truth to power and creating something more physical. How do we design truth to power? How do we think about spaces being a form of, of confronting power 
and acknowledging injustice and trying to write those scales of justice. So thank you very much. And for those of you who are not familiar with the, the banner at the top, um, another form of protest on Columbia's campus. Professor Foner. Uh, yes, uh, well, I, I want to thank uh, my colleagues and friends in the School of Architecture and Urban Planning everything for inviting me to take part in this uh, discussion here. I'm retired, actually, so I don't um, get to Columbia either physically or <laughs> virtually all that much anymore. Um, like my predecessor here, I'm a Columbia product. I was an undergraduate and graduate student here. I taught elsewhere for a while. Then I came back and was a professor in the history department for many years. So Columbia certainly has uh, shaped my uh, education and academic uh, career. Uh, what I want to talk about today is a little earlier, I guess, than what we just heard about, even earlier than the move up to uh, Morningside Heights in the 1880s and 90s. Um, Columbia's deep history in connection with slavery, anti-slavery, um, and the, what we call the Columbia and Slavery Project, which was initiated uh, a few years ago uh, with, I have to say, the support, financial and otherwise, of President Bollinger and his office. Um, and it's an ongoing project. It, it consists of basically of students doing uh, in a research seminar every year writing uh, papers based on original research about the history of Columbia and um, its connection to slavery, the legacy of slavery, race relations, uh, etc. I was uh, lucky enough to uh, direct this project for a while. It's now in the hands of uh, several of my colleagues and uh, former colleagues in the uh, history department. But as I say, the thing to really emphasize is how much research and writing was done by students in uncovering this very little known uh, history of our institution. Now, Columbia is not, you know, Georgetown, which owned and owned hundreds of slaves in the 19th century and very famously sold over 200 of them uh, at one time in the 1830s in order to um, financial, you know, uh, stabilize their finances. It's not the University of Virginia, which was constructed by slave labor, nor Clemson University in the South, which was constructed by convict labor in the late 19th century. Um, we're not a Southern institution. But um, nonetheless, uh, slavery was deeply connected, or Columbia was deeply connected with the institution of slavery from the beginning. Uh, by the way, speaking of site-specific discussions, uh, Columbia actually has the uh, unique situation, I think, among Ivy League schools that it moved twice. Harvard is in the same place it always was, so is Yale, etc. But Columbia started out way downtown as King's College, uh, near where Trinity Church now is. Uh, in the 1850s, it moved up to what is now Rockefeller Center. Uh, selling its land way downtown, and that sale made it instantaneously the richest university in the country for the time being. Um, and then, as you heard, in the 1890s, we moved up to Morningside Heights. Uh, sadly, because of those moves, a lot of the records of the university no longer exist. Our historical, the documentation that exists of the early history of Columbia is pretty thin compared to many um, of our so-called peer uh, institutions. Um, nonetheless, it is certainly clear that uh, Columbia was founded as King's College in um, 1754. And um, while the college did not own slaves, uh, everybody connected with it did, more or less. The first presidents, Samuel Johnson, the first president and his successors, most of them were slave owners. The, but maybe more important even, the money, <laughs> to, to follow the money, the money for Columbia came from well-to-do New York City merchants. This was a merchant's college, the board of trustees, or the governors as they called them, were mostly prominent merchants. Um, uh, so some of them were, were ministers in the Episcopalian church, to be sure. Many of the students, all male of course, then came from 
uh, merchant families that own slaves themselves. Now, again, this is not a plantation society. Those who owned slaves generally owned household, people who labored in their households, a few slaves, but they were all familiar with the institution of, um, of, of slavery. Slavery was a major factor in the economy of New York City uh, into the late uh, 18th century. At the time of the American Revolution, the population of New York City uh, was about 19,000, of which 3,000 were slave laborers, mostly working, as I said, in people's homes, but there were farms in New York City too, and there were slaves working on many of these farms uh, as well. Um, but the main point is this was a commercial city, and uh, its commerce was basically with the West Indies. So New York merchants became rich by transporting the goods produced by slaves in the West Indies, notably sugar, of course, um, and selling uh, pro agricultural products, basically, may, uh, grown in New York to the West Indian uh, islands. Some of them were also involved in the Atlantic slave trade. There were some governors or trustees of Columbia who were uh, slave traders, and uh, you know there are now online. Uh, there's now online information about all these slave voyages, and some Columbia figures uh, pop up as owners of some of these um, some of these uh, ships. Um, there are many runaway slave ads in colonial newspapers in New York, and indeed after the Revolution, uh, for slaves seeking to retrieve slaves uh, owned by people connected with. King's College or Columbia as it became after the revolution, um, seeking to retrieve those who had uh, run away. So uh, if you uh, add up the number of people involved with slavery and the money coming from uh, dealing in slaves and in the products produced by slaves, uh, you find that slavery was very, King's College was very closely connected with the institution of slavery. This is deeply rooted in our uh, institutional uh, history. Um, now, it, just as in many other aspects of life, the American Revolution raised the question of the future of slavery in, our, in this new nation, and um, a, a, a kind of mild anti-slavery movement developed during and after the Revolution, known as the New York Manumission Society, and some prominent Colombians were actively involved. The first president was John Jay, a, um, a graduate of Columbia, and also later on the first uh, Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. Our most famous um, graduate, although actually graduate is a misnomer, our most famous dropout, uh, Alexander Hamilton, um, also was, uh, although he had uh, you know, been raised early on in the West Indies, he came to the American colonies here, um, he was sort of vaguely anti-slavery. Uh, he criticized slavery, but he married into a prominent slave-owning family, the Schuyler family. Those who've seen the musical know all about this, more or less, <laughs> as long as you don't take it too seriously as history. Very entertaining. But anyway, Hamilton was also a figure in the Manumission Society, and the Manumission Society encouraged slave owners to voluntarily free their slaves in New York City, which many of them did, and it pressed for a law which was eventually passed in 1799 for the gradual abolition of slavery in New York State. It was very gradual. New York didn't completely rid itself of slavery until 1827. Uh, but, uh, and so even into um, the early 19th century, there are Columbia professors, Columbia trustees who, had, who owned a few slaves, although slavery declines pretty rapidly in New York but from the 1790s uh, onwards. Uh, the Manumission Society is sometimes considered kind of lacking in backbone compared to the more radical anti-slavery movement of the 1820s, 30s, 40s, Etc. cetera. Uh, but actually, they, um, they did some very valuable things. They set up the African free schools to educate uh, people who had become free. They said, well, you can't just free people who were denied education and leave it at that. So they, they put in money to try to educate African-Americans in New York City. 
uh, they monitored the, grad the implementation of the gradual emancipation uh, law. And when uh, some slave owners in the city tried to violate the law by shipping slaves out of state uh, to be sold, which was against the law, they uh, stepped in to try to stop it. Uh, but they certainly, uh, they were rather an elite group. They were all white. There were no black members of the Manumission Society. But nonetheless, there were some, uh, a good number of Colombians had a connection to that society. If you want a more radical kind of anti-slavery, you won't find it uh, at Columbia. In fact, basically the only real radical abolitionist connected with Columbia before the Civil War was John Jay II, the grandson of John Jay, the uh, manumission man. And John Jay II, who was an undergraduate here in the uh, 1830s, uh, became a pretty prominent New York City abolitionist. He was a lawyer. He fought in court to help fugitive slaves, try to prevent them from being sent back uh, to the South. Um, he was a Garrisonian, the radical wing of the uh, abolitionist movement. But you won't find too many of them uh, in Colombia in the 1820s, uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, etc. Another thing you won't find in Colombia in that period, which sets us apart from other institutions such as Harvard or Princeton, or Yale is uh, there were no Southern students here at Columbia, partly because we're, and we're still downtown, remember, around Trinity Church. There were no dormitories. So you had to have a place to live and a few, um, if any, uh, Southern students, uh, unlike Princeton, where half the students were from the South and then when the Civil War broke out, went down and fought in the Confederate Army. Um, uh, you didn't have the Southerners here. You did, though, at PNS, the medical school. Uh, which was uh, founded in the early 19th century. It was part of Columbia, then it wasn't part of Columbia, then it was part of Columbia again. Um, uh, the medical school was in the news the other day because President Bollinger announced that Bard Hall, uh, the uh, sort of one of the main residence halls up there at the, uh, at the medical campus, uh, was being renamed. Uh, it's unclear after whom right now, but Bar but Samuel Bard, who was one of the founders of PNS, the College of Physician and Surgeons, uh, and a very prominent physician of that time, was a significant slave owner. Also, uh, in 1810, he owned I think about 10 or 12 slaves, which was quite a few for us of New Yorker as late as 1810, and. Um, because uh, of a movement of students and faculty at Bard Ho uh, at uh, PNS to change the name so as not to honor him as a slave owner, uh, this is finally is being done now, uh, and it indicates the connection. There were more, many more Southerners studying medicine up there in PNS, and they objected strenuously to the possible presence of any African Americans, any Black students, uh, at PNS. Um, one black student was discovered, so to speak, by these Southern students. Uh, he had, he had, he's very light skinned, had been admitted to PNS, he'd studied and suddenly someone discovered he was black by the American definition of black, the so-called one drop rule, one ancestor, etc. cetera. Um, and he was expelled by the faculty uh, uh, for being black, basically, from PNS. Uh, a few, three or four black students were admitted to PNS, uh, and in fact graduated in the eight, late 18, in the 1830s. Why were they there? Well, the reason is they had to. They were being trained to be doctors in order to go to Liberia, which had been set up by the American Colonization Society as a place that. Um, emancipated slaves would either be uh, would be would voluntarily or forcibly go uh, uh, once they were free, and um, these uh, three or four black students were uh, forced to sign an agreement that after they graduated they would be they would leave the country. That was the only basis on which they could get an education, and uh, a couple of them did. One refused when uh, he graduated. Therefore, his uh, re degree was rescinded or not uh, bestowed, but he did re remain in New York City as a, uh, a, as a kind of physician um, uh, after that. Uh, so there were, of course, there were no black students at Columbia College at that time. In fact, Columbia would be one of the last of the Ivy League schools to have any black students, uh, unlike uh, some of the others who had a few, a handful before the Civil War. Columbia didn't have any. Uh, 
and a student from Liberia was uh, uh, admitted to what they called the School of Mines in the 1870s, was sort of like an engineering school. But as far as I can tell, the first African American, African American student uh, at Columbia College was in the early, around 1906 or seven, and very much later than Harvard or, or Dartmouth or places like that. Um, but a lot earlier than Princeton, I, I do have to say. I think in Princeton, the first one was from the 1940s. Um, so um, after the Civil War, of course, now during the Civil War, Columbia sided with the Union. The president of Columbia was a strong advocate of emancipation of the slaves. Uh, Columbia became a target. By this time, we're living, we're, we're up there around the 50th Street, uh, or where uh, Rockefeller Center is now. The New York City draft riot of 1963, uh, the mob, um, mostly Irish immigrants, resentful of the, of the draft and resentful of black people who they blame for the war, uh, they burned the Colored Orphan Asylum, which was at 43rd and 5th. Uh, fortunately, the, the children were evacuated before the building was burned. Um, and then they made their way up about seven or eight more blocks to try to <laughs> attack Colombia. Uh, the president of Colombia uh, rapidly got a Roman Catholic priest to come and address the rioters and tell them to go home, which they did, fortunately, for Colombia. Uh, but Colombia was associated with the Union war effort, in other words. It was associated with emancipation at this point. It was associated with raising black soldiers uh, to fight in the Civil War. Um, after the war, however, it went back to its normal uh, status of having little or nothing to do with um, African-American New Yorkers. Um, but, and I'm gonna stop in a minute because one could go on and on about this, but I do wanna make the point, as I said, that even though Columbia um, uh, was very late to admit black students, as undergraduates, it was actually very open in the early 20th century to African-American graduate students. If you look at the black intelligentsia, uh, the academic intelligentsia of let's say the 1920s and 30s, a lot of them got their degrees at Columbia, PhD degrees. Um, and uh, teachers college here trained a lot of black stu uh, st uh, students to go out and become teachers. So it's a kind of funny thing of exclusion at the undergraduate level, but a certain openness, much greater openness uh, than many other uh, Northern universities at the, uh, at the graduate level. Um, the only other thing uh, uh, that I wanna mention is, and you heard this in the previous speaker, is Columbia's long fraught relationship with the community around it. Uh, you heard about its move uptown. You heard about the efforts to sort of uh, get rid of quote unquote slums and this sort of thing. Um, certainly in the 1950s, there was a strong sentiment among the trustees to move Columbia altogether to Westchester County because the surrounding neighborhood with migration from the South and from Puerto Rico, the surrounding neighborhood was becoming um, racially and ethnically undesirable as far as the leaders of the university. Uh, were concerned. Uh, Columbia did not move to <laughs> Westchester, thankfully, uh, but it, um, but you know, it, it began buying up uh, residential buildings in the Columbia, in what is considered the Columbia neighborhood, in order to uh, make sure who was living nearby. And, uh, and as you heard, it began expanding eastward toward Harlem. This eventually culminated in the student uprising of 1968, one of whose demands was to stop building a gymnasium in which the university was gonna be building in Morningside Park there, which is a public space, of course, but was gonna be a private gymnasium with a small, separate, and very unequal little gym in the bottom for a community uh, residents. Even today, of course, uh, Columbia and the local community have um, uh, the, the tensions, uh, not necessarily unlike those that other universities have, town and gown kind of tensions, uh, fears about crime, fears about homelessness, fears about the wrong kind of people uh, moving into the neighborhood. Um, so um, let me just stop by saying that uh, those who wanna pursue this history more, uh, I 
direct you or commend you to look at the uh, website. Just Google Columbia University and slavery and you will find a lo much longer report that I wrote. You will find papers written by some of these undergraduate students. You will find videos uh, that they created. And, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's a very good project and it is keeping, it is still going strong. And as I say, to their credit, it still is getting support from the uh, administration, from the president, even if some of its findings uh, do not show the university in the most flattering light. So thank you for listening and um, I will stop there. Thank you so much. Uh, Mark? Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Great, thank you. And I just want to, before I start the presentation, my presentation, just give thanks to uh, Dean Andreos and Associate Dean Cohen and uh, and Lila Catelier for, uh, for making it possible for me to be here today and for inviting me. And uh, and I feel honored to be among such distinguished uh, scholars on this panel. <laughs> I don't feel I measure up, but you know, there's something perhaps that I, I can add to the conversation. Um, and you know, being that today is 9/11, and we and we um, we remember the anniversary of of the uh, of this event. Uh, I just wanted to speak a moment about that and how it relates to me, because um, at on that day in 2001, I was working. In uh, for the city of Newark, and I uh, usually on that particular day would take uh, public transportation from Manhattan to Newark. And that particular day, I took the A train down to the World Trade Center, where I would uh, transfer over to the PATH train, which took me to Newark. And um, that morning was a beautiful morning, and you know, nothing seemed out of the ordinary to me. So by the time I got to my office and sat down and got comfortable in my chair, I started getting reports that um, that uh, the World Trade Center, that a plane had struck the World Trade Center and I couldn't believe it. So we had a little black and white TV set up in the lunch area of the building where I worked and uh, we went in there, the other co my coworkers went in there to watch what was going on. And the only thing we could see were images of the smoke rising from uh, from one of the towers at first. And um, the only station that was broadcasting was the Spanish language station. So I didn't understand what was, what was being said, but we could see the images on the TV. And uh, from the image, I could see that there was this huge gaping hole in, in the building and in, 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 in the first tower that was struck. And now from my own training as an architect and training uh, with structural engineering i could i could tell that um, that uh, the building was in imminent danger of collapse because of this uh, theory of uh, the structural phenomena called the imminent uh, uh, i'm sorry um uh it, anyway the the um it was an eccentric load applied to the building because of this hole so I, you know i could tell that uh, there was going to be some, there was a huge amount of structural damage to the building and uh, and I could tell that there was going to be some damage that could re result in, uh, in collapse of the building. But yet I felt helpless. I felt helpless. I couldn't do anything. I was just watching this on the television. And little did I know that the workers, the people that were in the building, were being told by uh, the, the uh, security people in the building to stay in their offices and shelter in place, close their doors and shuttle in place. Yet I knew that the building was in imminent danger of collapse. So sure enough, uh, an hour later after the first attack, uh, we could see, um, now it took an hour because you, gotta, you have to remember that this plane hit the building full force and the temperature from the fuel in the jet was over 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. So that was high enough to actually melt the supports between the floor girders and the columns. And that caused the building to collapse like a pancake, both of both towers. 
Um, and it, it was just a horrifying experience for me to, to watch and to feel so helpless to see that happen. Now, I had a, a colleague, a fellow architect, who actually was in the building at the time that, uh, that the first plane hit. He was there to deliver some documents, I think, to the Port Authority. And um, so he delivered the documents, and as he was walking out the building, bodies were falling from the sky. And a body actually fell and hit the ground right next to him, still strapped into the airline seat. And that just completely freaked him out. So today will always have special meaning to me. Um, you know, it's more than just an event that we read about in history books or watch on TV. It's, it's a very personal, personal thing to me to have to survived it and, and to be here today to talk about that. So now, um, Today, I want to actually uh, discuss three questions as part of my presentation. Um, by the way, before I start that, I just wanted to challenge Professor Fono just a little bit um, because he mentioned um, how Columbia or King's College at the time when it was founded was all white. And, um, and he mentioned uh, Alexander Hamilton and, and the New York Manumission Society being all white. But uh, we know that Alexander Hamilton, his, his mother was a mixed race woman. And so by the definition of the one drop rule, he would actually be considered black. So he may be considered the first black student for King's College, Columbia University and many mission society. So we can maybe debate about that, but you know, I think you know, using that one drop rule definition, he may uh, actually have been the first black uh, student at, at King's College. So now I'm going to switch over to my presentation. If I can just do this. Is everyone seeing this? And I need to to switch over to share. Okay. Um, so today, are you still hearing me? Can you still see me? Yep, perfect. Great. Okay. So today I want to address three questions. Um, first being the who, the how, and the why. Uh, on And when I'm talking about the who, I'm talking about who am I? You know, why am I part of this conversation? Um, now, on the surface, uh, we can say that I am, you know, a double degree alumnus of, of GSAP. I'm a licensed architect and I'm a licensed professional planner and the former director of planning for the largest city in New Jersey. Um, the how I want to talk about is how did, uh, and we've um, talked about this in, in Erica's presentation a bit and also Professor Bonus' presentation about how Columbia University ended up being in War War Morningside Heights. So that has been, co been covered. Um, so I may just add a little bit more to that. And then the why. Why are we here? Why am I here today? Why are we here today? So, excuse me. Um, So this is my great-grandmother. My uh, great-grandmother on my mother's side of the family. And she was born a slave on a plantation in, in South Carolina in 1852. Now you can see by her complexion, you know, she wasn't completely African, but her mother was a slave on the plantation, a 14-year-old girl, who became pregnant by the plantation owner's son. And the plantation owner was a man named uh, Robert uh, Alston, who eventually, be, who eventually became governor of South Carolina. So, you know, there's this little known and little discussed story about slavery, about how slave owners were creating their own slaves on their plantation. Why is that? 
Why is that? Is because there was a, a, a law that uh, Congress, the U.S. Congress passed in 1807 called the Slave Importation Act, which banned the imp importation of slaves beginning as of January 1st, 1808. So the slave, the, the plantation owners could no longer import slaves from Africa. And so what they started to do was create their own slaves. And so this, my grandmother was a product of the slave owner's family and a young 13 year old slave who became pregnant and gave birth to her when she was 14. And you have to remember at that time, slaves were considered property, chattel property. They were no better than any farm animal that may have existed on, on the plantation. They were not, they had no rights, they were not citizens. And the fact that, you know, they were not citizens was enforced uh, in the Dred Scott decision of 1856, which the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Tawney actually wrote that decision and actually stated in that decision that uh, black people, whether they are slave or free, were not US citizens and had no rights that a white man was bound to respect. So this particular Supreme Court decision was a catalyst for the, the Civil War, which lasted from 1861 to 1865. And that's a war where 600,000 soldiers gave their lives, they lost. It was the deadliest war that the United States has ever fought. Um, I hit the wrong button. Let's try this. So my great-grandmother, Amarinta, had six children shown in this, in, in this photograph. Uh, four of those children actually um, left uh, Charleston and they made their way to New York. Uh, they migrated to New York. They were migrants as opposed to immigrants because of the conditions in the South. Uh, two, the two on the left remained in Charleston. The one that was second from the left actually was a, was a doctor, a medical doctor who became a director of a, of a hospital in Charleston that treated uh, African-American patients. So my grandfather's in the middle, the third from the left, and he made his way to Harlem because he wanted to get out of the South because of the horrific conditions in the South. And this is in Harlem is where he met his wife, who was from the South also from North Carolina. In fact, all of my grandparents were from the South, either from Virginia, North Carolina, or South Carolina. And so they met and formed the family in Harlem. And one of those children that they had was my mother on the right in this photograph. And we can see the progress from slavery to the point where I became a graduate of Columbia University within the space of a hundred something years. And those are my uh, siblings on the left uh, by my mother's second marriage. And so this uh, photograph was taken in 1976 in front of Lowell Library. Um, but going back to the history of, of uh, the university. Um, we can see from this image, from this map, the, uh, the site where the university would eventually locate, and it was occupied by what is called an insane asylum. We don't use that terminology anymore, but it was the Bloomingdale Insane Asylum. And, and that actually is the, is the site where the library was built. And we can see that the area around was pretty much vacant. It was um, an area that was still undeveloped. And so, you know, Columbia University at the time in the 1890s had plenty of room to locate there and to expand. But it, it was with actually the, uh, the opening of the uh, subway, New York City subway in 1804, that created this development explosion, particularly in Upper Manhattan. So as we go forward, um, we can see that uh, as uh, Professor uh, 
uh, Avrami uh, 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 mentioned, you know, there was a lot of development took place after the opening of, of the subway. Uh, and actually that first subway went from, uh, and if you don't know the history of the subway, it went from City Hall in Lower Manhattan up to 42nd Street, across 42nd Street, then up Broadway to 145th Street. So it was perfect. This area was perfect for development because it, it was, you know, a rapid transit system, a public transit system that provided easy access from Upper Manhattan to Lower Manhattan, where a lot of the businesses were. So um, this image of the campus, as we've seen before from from Professor Abrami's uh, uh, presentation, we can see in the 1920s um, that. Uh, um, the, the, the campus actually ended uh, around 114th Street. This, this was at a time when Butler Library hadn't even been built. And that didn't happen until the 1930s. And the campus actually, if you look uh, at the top of the image, uh, um, you'll see uh, that it pretty much ended uh, around 118th Street. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but um, uh, it's not what we know as Columbia University today. So fast forward to 1966 and Columbia University is having all of these uh, pressures to expand. They have this desire to expand and they're noticing that their gymnasium was not up to snuff in terms of matching the facilities of other Ivy League uh, universities. So they decided, well, we're gonna, we, we want to create a new gymnasium that's uh, state of the art. But there was very little land left. So the university said, well, um, let's expand to the east into Morningside Park, a public park. We're going to put our gymnasium in a public park and we're going to cut it off to everyone else except the university students. Now, that was the plan in 1966. The construction actually started in 1968. The construction started in late April 1968. Now you have to remember back to 1968. 1968 was a time of great revolution in the United States. Um, we were, we were, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King had been assassinated on April 4th, 1968. Um, Bobby Kennedy, John, uh, President Kennedy's brother was running for president that year. He was assassinated in June of 1968. Um, students were upset about the Vietnam War and the university's complicity with, with the war effort. Um, you have to remember that Columbia University was the site of the Manhattan Project and that uh, where the atomic bombs were developed that uh, were deployed over Japan uh, in World War II. There was also an organization that was connected with the federal, federal government called the Institute for Defense Analysis that was housed on the campus. And so the, the students, you know, when uh, the black students, particularly on campus, discovered that the construction on this gymnasium was starting in um, in late April, and that community residents wouldn't be allowed to use the gymnasium, they they took to the campus and demonstrated, and demonstrated to the point where they actually took over uh, Hamilton Hall. And so a lot of the white students also were sympathetic, and they came and and occupied uh, the the hall also, uh, but they had a larger agenda more than just a gymnasium and the you know the the attempt by the university to take over part of this public park for a private gymnasium so the 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 white students on campus wanted to expand the conversation to also the vietnam war which was going on at the time and wanted to protest the vietnam war as well as the gymnasium and so was a compromise made between the black students and the white students where Black students said, okay, well, we're going to continue occupying Hamilton Hall 
and uh, the white students agreed to go and occupy Low Library. So there was a split, but eventually students on campus eventually ended up occupying, I think, at least five buildings on campus. Uh, Hamilton, Lowe, Fairweather, and uh, Ferris Booth Hall, which is now, I think, Lerner Hall, the Student Activity Center, and uh, I think there was maybe one other building. Um, and that, th those protests on campus were, it shut down the entire university. Um, and we can see on the right, uh, this uh, poster this, uh, that was handed out um, to rally students to protest the, the, the construction of this gym and um, which eventually, and it was, <laughs> it was a play on words uh, because uh, um, Jim Crow was a, an acronym for uh, the segregation laws that were in place in the United States during the period between uh, Plessy versus Ferguson and, and Brown versus Board of Education decision. So they, they were known as uh, Jim Crow laws, and I think maybe even during Reconstruction, I think Professor Boner can probably expand on the definition of Jim Crow. Um, but anyway, uh, it was a play on words, and so, it, but it, it, it catalyzed the students, and uh, it was um, the reason why there were so many protests on campus, and eventually, um, as the construction started, students attempted to tear the fence down at the construction site in late April. Um, the, the first demonstration started on April 23rd and by, uh, as we can see here, they were occupying the buildings. They was, um, had completely taken over Hamilton Hall. They had taken over the Dean's office in Hamilton Hall and they were also occupying Low Library. That was, you know, a time of revolution <laughs> that uh, perhaps students today um, don't have uh, a complete comprehensive comprehension of. But uh, 1968 was also the year of the, the Democratic uh, Convention in Chicago and the birth of, uh, of uh, students for the Democratic Society, SDS, and the Weather Underground, a lot of other revolutionary groups among students. And it was not just at Columbia, but Columbia catalyzed uh, protests among students at universities all, all across the country, including Berkeley and California. So what happened? They were there in the hall, occupying Hamilton Hall, and um, they were there for a week. And finally, the university said, we've had enough. So the university decided to call in the police. And uh, over a thousand police showed up on the campus on April 30th to, uh, to make arrests. Over 700 students were arrested, but, um, and we can see uh, uh, local community people and, and, and people who were uh, in support of, of the demonstrations were there at the construction site to stop the construction from going forward. Um, so as a result of all the demonstrations, the, uh, with the students, uh, the, the, the university administration negotiated with the students and the community. And they came to a resolution where they would stop the construction of the gymnasium. But we can see in this photograph, there are still scars in the park from where, on the left, where the construction had actually been started. So um, this is part of the reason why why I'm here today to talk about that history. But another reason is because of Dr. King and his assassination made the, made the university have a conversation among itself. You know, what are we doing and how can we um, answer to Dr. King's legacy of, uh, in the United States? So, as a result of Dr. King's uh, assassination, the university opened up uh, and became more diverse in terms of its student body. And I guess I was a beneficiary of, of that in 1973 when I became a student at Columbia. Um, but the other reason why I'm here today also is to remember George Floyd and how he catalyzed demonstrations and protests 
all across the United States as a result of his uh, murder. Um, and so it was because of him that we're having a conversation today and why I'm here. And there are many other people like me who could be here, but fortunately the, the university decided that, you know, I would be the one to talk about some of this history and why we're having this conversation today. So I'd like to thank you, thank everyone for, for uh, putting up with me for these few minutes to talk a little bit about uh, the university and its history in terms of the tension it's had with the community. Um, I also you know, wanted to mention that as an undergrad, I worked for an organization called the Architects Renewal Committee in Harlem. I did a lot in terms of planning work for the community. Uh, I also worked for the Harlem East Harlem Model Cities program, which had which did, which did some planning work also for the community. But there's always been this this tension between the university up on the hill on the Acropolis and the slow income community below in Harlem. And even today, even most recently, as December of last year, we've seen this tension flare up with, uh, with the unfortunate uh, death of uh, Tessa Majors, who was an undergraduate uh, student in Barnard. So with that, I want to thank you, and, and uh, we can move on to the next presentation. Thank you so much, Mark. Dr. Fully Love? Hi. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. and. Uh, really enjoyed everything that's been said so far. As I'm uh, a psychiatrist and not a historian, I thought I would just, um, and I also don't work for Columbia University anymore, thank God. Um, what I thought I would do is just talk about Columbia and me. So as was mentioned, I'm a graduate of Columbia. I have a master's in nutrition <clears throat> and I have uh, my MD from Columbia University. So, um, but what I, I wanted to talk about today was, uh, for some reason this reminded me of a conference I was at in Feb February. I, I was actually thinking the conference had to be in 2019 because we've been in lockdown for a long time. Uh, but actually it was in February. It was just shocking to think about how strange time is in this lockdown period. But I was at a wonderful conference by the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference. It was called Decade of Destiny, Engaging the Powers. Um, and this is from Ephesians. Uh, and the, the three verses that are relevant are, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to, to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. It was a, the conference was a wonderful time to engage with very senior black clergy, some of whom I've known for many years, um, and to really understand how they thought about this. But this set of verses are, are commonly referred to as powers and principalities, and the recognition that, that we're in struggle with powers and principalities, um, that it is what this is about. So my understanding of this as powers and principalities started when I was in Columbia as a student um, in, in both of those programs. Like Columbia was <clears throat> always a mixed bag. There were certainly uh, cutting edge concepts uh, in my nutrition program which really is the foundation of my approach to the world, we learned about sort of nutrition from molecules to society. So we studied um, how vitamins act at the level of molecules, but we also looked at how hunger and other kinds of problems are created by society. Um, but I also had the extraordinary experience of thinking that my, that the director of the program, Myron Winnick, might like to help out in Newark, New Jersey, where colleagues of mine were working. Um, and so he came to visit, but was so arrogant uh, and so intolerant of the black leadership in Newark 
that they kicked him out. Um, it was really shocking to me to see that. So, so the sort of ways in which classism, racism, sexism, and homophobia were always present, um, you know, were, it was always there. So then I went to medical school, and certainly in medical school, there were lots of opportunities to see these things. Um, at that time, the structure of the hospital was that there was a, a whole hospital for wealthy white people. And then the Presbyterian hospital was for poor people who lived in the neighborhood. Um, the encroachment of the hospital on the neighborhood was a constant presence. Um, and then within the medical school itself, or within all the whole structure of it, it was run by, by white men. And then down at the bottom, the people who had the lowest paying jobs were people who were black and brown. As a black student there, I was so grateful that they were there because they helped take care of me and helped buffer um, with the, the experience of being in that kind of um, structural classism, racism, sexism, homophobia, the, the ways in which that comes at you. The, which, which is what I think is like, it was like why you have to put on the whole armor of God, um, however you want to think about that metaphorically. Um, that, that sometimes the people who are cleaning the hospital, who are black and brown people, are the armor of God when you're a black student in that kind of isolation and that kind of hostility. So um, I would say that I encountered Columbia as a corporate actor most dramatically when I published my book, Ruchak. So um, I uh, came to the study of urban renewal um, kind of it, as, a, as an outcome of looking at the AIDS epidemic and the ways in which the AIDS epidemic had been shaped by urban policies. Um, and so urban renewal was one of those urban policies and I wanted to understand the black perspective. So Erica in her early remark, earlier remarks were talking about it sort of from the perspective of really of, of the white actors. But it turns out that nobody actually talked to the black people who were the majority of those being displaced about what their experience was. So though my work was retrospective, we wanted to go back and say to people, well, you know, what do you remember? What, what, what happened? What was that like? So this is actually a, a cartoon from France, but this is really, it kind of conceptually, what is happening um, that, that the, this kind of the earlier 19th century American city, which has been completely built out and completely developed, is being transformed into these towers in the park. And, and in a way, it's very fundamentally about enclosure of the land for, and, and in American process, they talk about it as, as clearing the land for higher uses, which basically was not housing black people. I spent a lot of time in Pittsburgh and it was one of the primary places where I learned this story. And so this is the a, a depiction of the Lower Hill as it abuts downtown Pittsburgh and the way that the, the urban renewal plan was depicted having sort of plastic cutouts on an aerial photo with the, the theory being that they would clear the land, they'd put in some highways, basically making a, a barrier between the hill and downtown Pittsburgh. And also that they put in that circle which was the spaceship of the civic arena. This is what it looks like before. Um, the Hill District was a very famous African-American community, one of the great jazz spots, um, but full of, of life and organization, e extremely vital place. Um, so that was bulldozed and then the civic arena was put in and that very spaceship looking and I, as psychiatrists read this as three levels of barriers that are put in between the African-American Hill District and the downtown, the highways, the huge parking lots, and then the spaceship. And if you think about sort of 1960s jokes about spaceships, uh, basically you don't want to walk past a spaceship. This is another view of the spaceship, which has now been demolished. Uh, this photo is, a, I think, a very important photo because it's the people who made the urban renewal plan. One thing about Pittsburgh is that they, it's, it's a picture, city that loves to take pictures of itself. So you have pictures of the people who made the plan, 
here in, I believe they're in the Morgan Bank. And they made the, one of the reasons they were going to make the Civic Arena was that, sorry, my mouse dropped, was that they wanted to uh, have a place for Edgar Kaufman, the department store magnate, to listen to Civic Light Opera in the open air. And this is another very important picture because there, there are about five black people in this photograph, but all the rest of the people are white. So they were clearing the black neighborhood, the important black neighborhood for white entertainment. Um, a, a picture of, of the neighborhood um, and another picture of Wiley Avenue, one of the important corridors of the neighborhood. Crawford Grill that you see on the left was one of the important jazz clubs and one of the few to survive. So we see the density all the number of shops, the vitality, people in the streets. Uh, and there are, happen to be um, tens of thousands of photographs of this neighborhood, which document what I'm saying about its vitality, its complexity, and its importance. This is just one by Charles T. Harris, who was called One Shot because he would go to an event and take one shot of the scene. And when I talk with my students about this photo, I'd like to raise the question, how many organizations does it take to make a marching band? And you can really find many. Actually, my next door neighbor, the photographer Richard Saunders, was in Pittsburgh as part of the Pittsburgh Photographic Project and took this picture uh, along with many others. But it's this picture that I think um, it most stands in stark contrast to the earlier photo of the men who made the urban renewal plan. They made the urban renewal plan, uh, but it was these men who lived in the neighborhood who had no voice in what was going to happen to their neighborhood. So th this is a um, sort of a, how do you read a street scene and what do you know about a neighborhood from seeing that People can sit on the street and play checkers and other people can stand around and watch this sort of theater of the open air. Um, I mean, for one thing, you know that there's not COVID, um, but for another thing, you know that there's peace and safety. This is another photo that I think is uh, of fundamental importance for understanding what was going on in the Hill District. Uh, so this photo was taken by Esther Bubbly, also of the Pittsburgh Photographic Project at Hill House. And the importance of such a moment of quiet learning is that just as it takes many organizations to make a marching band, it takes many organizations to create quiet learning and they have to be on the same page. So this is testimony to the nature of the neighborhood, which outsiders were saying was blighted and was a slum. I, I've come to think that we ought to think of, we ought not to ever say blight again, we ought to call it the B word and we ought never say slum, we ought to say the S word, just as we now say the N word, uh, that they ought to be considered as equally defamatory and, and chased out of the language. The community fought back against urban renewal. They were not able to stop the first round of urban renewal, but the city came back to do a second round. The community raised this billboard on a corner that is now recognized as uh, as a, as a local park and site of local activity and um, organizing. Um, so it's become a hallowed site in the aftermath of this billboard. Um, so the, the community learned from what happened to them, the, the many, many, many losses that were incurred because of urban renewal. And, the list of losses is so profound uh, because it has to do with the wreckage, not only of the individual life, but of the matrix in which that individual life is being lived. That, that matrix of the many organizations on the same page that have created the calm for learning. In a way, if you think of Maslow's hierarchy as a kind of triangle, you've taken the bottom out of the triangle and the whole thing has collapsed. Um, which, of course, on this day resonates with uh, Mark's very touching story about the collapse of the World Trade Center. We have an urban renewal done the same thing for people taken, gone through the middle and made the whole thing collapse. So um, I published this book in 2004 
um, second edition came out in 2016, but the fir first printed in 2004, which was just as Columbia was starting, was really starting its public campaign to snatch Manhattanville and to do eminent domain, to do urban renewal of Manhattanville. And um, I was at a talk that President Bollinger gave to leaders in Washington Heights. And one of the stunning things that he said was that Columbia needed this land because it had to expand 2.2 million square feet every couple of years, every so many years, in order to be a top research university. But this was progress, and you wouldn't want to stand in the way of progress. And uh, I was stunned because that was exactly the language, the headline, for example, of the newspaper in St. Louis announcing its urban renewal plan that they would clear slums and blight for progress. And progress was the whole rhetoric around it. So I was stunned that so many years later, it was the same rhetoric and, and no acknowledgement of the cost. So I went to everybody I could go to at Columbia, um, at the top, at the provost and president, people who had reached out to me that I'd talked to on other occasions, I'd been invited to cocktail parties. So I thought, you know, was, you know, listen, I want to tell you about my research and I want to tell you what I found. And I think you should be taking it into account as you do this project. Uh, nobody returned my calls, nobody returned my emails. And um, a colleague of mine told me that she'd been asked to write a review of my book for uh, one of the alumni magazines, she too is an alum, and it was accepted and then rejected. And afterwards, I was not invited to cocktail parties uh, with the provost or the president anymore. So the kinds of, of uh, access and warmth that I had experienced, I, I did not. And even the kind of recognition that I had done a major piece of scholarly work, there was no recognition in any of the Columbia publications. So that was my, my real encounter a real encounter with Columbia as powers and principalities, as a corporate actor. But, and, and here I use the word principalities, uh, Columbia as a set of principalities. So these are not all the same. Um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about a project that I've been involved with, uh, which is now 16 years old, going into its 17th year. The Klein Project, City Life is Moving Bodies which we started out of Mailman School of Public Health, my research group, the community research group. Um, basically, Highbridge Park had been abandoned um, by the city and we, it, it had, was a very dangerous park. There were all kinds of horrible things that were happening in there. And we wanted to reclaim this beautiful park as a part of, of the neighborhood. So, the Climb Project was focused on making a hiking trail to connect what we call the cliffside parks. So this includes Morningside Park, St. Nicholas Park, Jackie Robinson Park, and Highbridge Park. This was our, our the map that Marshall Brown, urban, urban architect and designer, Marshall Brown made for us when we started the project. And he made our logo, Climb, City Life is Moving Bodies. Uh, and we wanted to make a hiking trail through those cliffside parks based on our observation that they almost touched and that if we could just figure out the best path to get from one to the other, people could hike through those really quite glorious uh, spaces. So our project is called Hike the Heights and focused on, has focused for the past 16 years on an annual party in the parks on the first Saturday of the month. And uh, so this is one of the additions of Hike the Heights. Uh, my daughter Molly is hiking with kids who are coming um, up the path to the party in Highbridge Park. They're in Highbridge Park for the party. And they're kids with the Harlem Children's Zone. So this is very early Hike the Heights too. One of the things was that the, uh, one of our graduate students had the idea that our trail looked a bit like a giraffe. And so the giraffe became our spirit animal and continues to be our spirit animal. And uh, during this advocacy for the parks, much has happened, much investment. So in 2005, you see a photograph by Rod Wallace, what the park looked like at that time when we were starting. And in 2011, as the investment was coming in to reopen the Highbridge, what was starting to happen in, in terms of the, the reclaiming and the reopening of the park. And we are, are very proud to have been part of, of this um, reanimation, rebirth, 
of these parks and to have helped advocate for what is now about $150 million of investment in that area. And this was very much done with the support of a wide array of projects at Columbia University Melbourne School of Public Health. So the Center for Children's Environmental Health was a crucial early supporter. And Bruce Link, who had a Center for Youth Violence Prevention, was a crucial supporter for a number of years. The students have been very active in keeping this project going and did practicum where they ran the project. So without Mailman School of Public Health as, a, as an advocate for this, we would not have been able to do this work. So the principality of Mailman School of Public Health and then its kind of sub fiefdoms uh, were active in this way of being good neighbors. So the, um, thing I want, so this is a, a map we made of Hike the Heights and our trail has been recognized as um, in the New York Times as one of the five places to be outdoors and see nature. And actually when you're there, uh, you don't actually have the sense that you're in the city. They have a, a beautiful, beautiful video on the New York Times site about little, little raccoons. It was gorgeous. So uh, this, we made this icon for our 10th anniversary and you can see the hiking giraffe who was our spirit animal and obviously has been, had many paper mache versions made every year, school kids and others collaborate to make versions. So, um, so confronting the power of Columbia University had a lot of ramifications in my own life as a scholar at Columbia University. Um, but um, within the principalities, there was a lot, of, a lot of places where people could use the resources that they had for good. So I think it's a complicated place. And what's gonna be difficult in the work that GSAPP is setting out on is that if you don't confront the powers, it, and what they did, for example, to Manhattanville, uh, you will have not done the whole work. But if you confront the powers, it may be very costly. So in this moment, um, especially on today, as we think about 9-11, I'd like to leave you with this, this photo um, that we took in the park, because we have um, a massive attack on love coming from the President of the United States, who is every day doing something to increase fear and to increase hatred and to increase racism. And so uh, as, a, as a social psychiatrist, I believe that it's incumbent on every organization, including the GSAPP, including Columbia University, every organization, whatever we succeeded at or failed at in the past, in this moment, to think, how do we turn on the love and confront the fear so that the United States can have sound conversations about the huge crises that face us, which include not only racism, but obviously ecological catastrophe. So with that, I'd like to stop. Thank you so much. Uh, amazing presentations uh, by all of you, Erica, Eric, Mark, uh, Mindy, and Amal. Uh, thank you so much for your presentations. And uh, if I may, I will call you by your first name. Um, I, there are some very interesting questions, and I have my own, but I, I thought that I would go uh, through some of the questions. Um, the first one is uh, addressed to uh, Professor Horner, and it's from uh, Professor uh, Jorge Otero Pilos. Um, regarding the renaming of Columbia facilities, have there been any discussions about Jean Shea Dining Hall? Can you speak more about how your project rethinks our relationship to this historical figure who are part of being regent of Columbia College, president of Manu Mission, society was also an slave owner? Uh, 
the very uh, yeah. wait, let me uh, unmute myself. Sorry. Uh, hmm. Am I? Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm not 100% sure what discussions are going on in the university about, in the administration, about figures like this. As I said, the name of Samuel Bard has just been removed from a major building up at the medical center. John Jay is an interesting character. He was a slave owner indeed, but he was also president of the Manumission Society and assisted uh, emancipated slaves in New York City. Um, Frankly, I think he's uh, more honorable than some of the other people who have uh, things named after them around uh, Columbia University. Um, but I, I think there will be this fall, a, uh, or this spring, and, and then uh, this fall, and then next spring, a, um, a discussion as is going on in many other places about naming of, in, of things, statues to people, buildings, uh, monuments. Should there be more monuments on campus? What if there is no monument anywhere to, that I know of to an African-American person connected with Columbia, uh, although some very distinguished ones have been uh, students or teachers here. Um, so I think that's a conversation that is going to be happening uh, now. Um, and uh, I think it's important that everybody who has an opinion about this should weigh in with the administration, with the president, with the provost, uh, just as many people up at the uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons, Surgeons weighed in about changing the name of Bard Hall. Um, so I, 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 I think more changes will be coming, but I don't have any particular information about that. And um, I would love to see a little monument to John Jay II, as I said, the uh, only true abolitionist who was an active uh, Colombian uh, before the Civil War. So um, John Jay Hall is really about his grandfather, but uh, maybe we can do something for John Jay II in that context also. Thank, thank you. Um, this is for you, Mindy. Uh, when I uh, an anonymous person says, when I was an undergraduate, circa 20, 2010, protest against Columbia expansion into Manhattanville was an enormous part of our student culture. My peers who organized these protests have grown to become important activists in the realm, realms of immigration, police brutality, and land use. Thank you, Dr. Pulilov, for bringing this comment up. Why did GSAP in the, well, this is not a question for you, but for GSAP, actually. Why did GSAP recent book on Manhattanville campus completely dismiss this dissent? I, I would like to ask you, Mindy, if, um, if you'd like to comment uh, on this comment. Yeah, of course, I don't know anything about why your, the GSAP book didn't comment on the dissent, the dissent was very important. And the, and the dissent was really a coalition between community activists and student activists on campus. Uh, and the, but the, I, I really appreciate the point that acting against Columbia taught people how to take on other issues. And the, the powers are, are very much united. The, the people who are on the board of Columbia University are on the boards of lots of other important corporations and they're political figures. So the powers that run Columbia are also the powers that are running the nation and making immigration policy, making police brutality policy. So taking on Columbia teaches us about taking on uh, the, the, the powers and principalities. And so um, I think what is important is the advice that the Black ministers were helping me understand at the conference in February, which is put on the whole armor of God when you're going to do it. Thank you. Um, I wonder if Erica, you want to comment on this topic too. So I will say that students in our studio did also look at Manhattanville um, and the way in which uh, uh, you know, that the the claiming of space within Manhattanville, not only in our recent history, but also going back to um, the mid um, uh, 20th century, for sure, was problematic. I mean, it, it as you saw from some of the protest posters and things, um, this was um, 
you know, I, I have to defer to, to Mindy's, you know, words on this. This was root shock. You know, this was uh, an uprooting of a community um, and that the institution uh, chose to repeat that in some way um, with uh, the expansion northwards and the creation of the Manhattanville campus is troubling as someone who's both a preservationist and an urban planner. Um, I also take Mindy's point about the danger of me saying that. I'm a not yet tenured faculty member and I fully recognize that me saying this um, puts me in a vulnerable position. But as I mentioned at the early part of our conversation, I think if we don't reckon with this, if we don't put it out there and talk about it um, as a way to work toward more just solutions, um, we will continue to repeat the past. Well, I, I think not only that, I think uh, Mindy's point is that confronting the power of Colombia is the only way to, uh, to be a full person within Colombia. If it, it's like, if, if, if we don't, then um, we, are, we are failing our uh, mission statement of, of being part of this, this uh, community and furthering this community. Um, and um, I wonder if anyone else wants to comment on, on that point or if I should go to the next question that is also about Manhattan Bill. The next question, I think uh, probably, uh, probably, probably Mark, you can comment on this. On the Manhattan Bill side, Columbia used eminent domain to also take hold of the McDonald's site in 125th Street, designating it as a new site for the Columbia Secondary School. In 2019, it was made public that Columbia was designing a hotel faculty housing on that site. To my, to my knowledge, there have barely been any protests regarding this move university-wide. Why don't we see protests anymore? Can, can you talk about um, the the difference in the mood from 1968 to now in terms of like speculating why you think that uh, protests um, student protests namely Columbia student protests have shifted well you know as I said in 1968 it was more than just about Columbia um, occupying a public park for the private gymnasium it was also there were also other issues that were involved, and it was just after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, and it was also during the period of the Vietnam War when students were afraid that they may be drafted in that, and, and their own, you know, um, um, their own uh, objections to, to fighting in a war that uh, some considered to be unjust. So we haven't seen that kind of uh, protest on campus where students actually took over the entire campus and shut it down. And I, you know, I, I neglected to mention that one of those buildings that was uh, taken over by the students in 1968 was Avery Hall. <laughs> so um, uh, the architecture students were very much a part of the protests and the demonstrations. But I, you know, I, I was part of a, a group of architects called Arch 527 that actually tried to get uh, a contract under the Manhattanville project. It had to be, you know honest in, in saying that uh, we we saw this as, as an opportunity being that we were um, local local architects and and that the university had actually negotiated a community benefits agreement with the community that said that the university would hire local people but then when this group of architects I was associated with uh, approached the university to say you know we would be interested in working on the design of, of this new campus uh, the university said, "Oh no, you don't. You don't count. You're professional, so we we don't really think of you as being part of the community benefits agreement." So um, I don't know, you know, the specifics of what's happening with the McDonald's site and the hotel, but um, you know, the 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 kind of attitude that this that the university has had is 
has carried over from 1968 to Manhattanville and even beyond. Um, I, I also think it's important to talk about some of the words that uh, that all your presentations uh, commented on, uh, the use of the word blighted, slam, uh, the use of the word um, progress, uh, the contrast uh, between uh, uh, ways of seeing new buildings uh, uh, and ways of uh, describing existing conditions. Um, I'm also would like to throw into um, our conversation the real estate term, the uh, the best uh, was the highest and best use, uh, which is usually associated, and it's something that as architects uh, are told uh, often that we need to aim to the highest and best use, and of course this is not related to community or um, any kind of um, democratic ideals, but is highest and best use as it appears in a spreadsheet of uh, cost calculations. And so um, I would like, uh, from your point of view in the different disciplines, um, can you comment uh, further on the use of these words? Yeah, I can definitely comment on that. You know, when I began my, uh, um, <laughs> my career as a student at Columbia in 1973 as an urban planning student, um, you know, I started going through the literature and I started reading, you know, all this, you know, the literature that had been ex existing at the time about uh, slums and, and uh, blighted communities. And, you know, I was, I was quite shocked because I was a kid that grew up in New York. I mean, I was born in D.C. I was born at a time when, when Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, was, was still a segregated uh, city. Um, and then as a, as, a, as, a, as a child, you know, my, uh, my family moved to New York and we lived in the South Bronx. Uh, we lived in Bedford-Stuyvesant. We lived in, in, in Bushwick, Brooklyn, and in a, in a housing project for nine, nine years. And eventually we moved to Queens uh, where my parents bought, bought a home. But, um, you know, I was quite shocked where these, these places, these communities where I lived were being were, were, were being described as slums uh, and blighted communities when I knew them as, as, as home. <laughs> so it was quite a shock that, you know, that's, you know, the words we use are, are, are very important. And, and sometimes, you know, we, we need to take a reexamination of, of, of the terminology we use as professionals. I would, I would underscore that, Galia, um, and I, I, <clears throat> I take the point that, that language is incredibly powerful in this, right, and, and the rhetoric and the discourse that, that evolves um, is really, uh, can be both damaging um, as well as um, an opportunity to reframe narratives. Uh, but I, I would also, since we're in this context of, of GSAP, uh, I would also paraphrase um, something that, that was written by Emma Ozor, who is a co-founder of Black Space, in that as architects and planners, we are trained to look at disinvested space as opportunities. Like, you know, if something is poorly maintained or crumbling, et cetera, we look at that as, oh, it's an opportunity. It's close to a blank slate, so to speak. When in fact, we are not looking deeply enough at why certain places, certain communities, certain properties are disinvested in. Um, we're not looking at enough of the history of redlining and how that was complicit in, in um, uh, marginalizing communities, limiting their access to capital. We're not looking enough at the role of power in, in urban renewal and the way in which choices about quote unquote progress very uh, explicitly sought to marginalize certain populations. Um, and so we see these landscapes of, of quote unquote disinvestment and we think about highest and best use in response to that um, in part because of the conditioning we have as architects and planners. So I, I challenge us to really in this conversation about repair um, to look deeply to really interrogate the past in every place 
not simply look at a place at face value, but understand the spaces and the people that were part of that place. Um, Absolutely. I think you are making also a point for, um, for preservation, uh, pre pre community preservation, not just preservation of um, the physical aspects or the physicality of, of spaces, but the human aspects of it or, uh, or the embody of histories within it. I'm getting a 10 minute warning here. Uh, there's two other questions. I'm just going to read them and then you, you can decide uh, which one to reply to or how to reply. Um, an interesting point about Columbia being late in admitting students of colors at the undergrad le level versus at the gradual level was brought up. What is, in your opinion, may have been the reason for that discrepancy? The other question is, is there any research on how colorism, shadism, played out in the racism of these specific histories around Colombia? Perhaps, perhaps as a counter narrative to the idea of a one drop rule being a great equalizer. I, I, yeah, I, it's a good, I don't know the answer to why the graduate school here was so much more open to, uh, and the professional schools were so much more open to uh, students of color of one kind or another. And indeed, of course, women were in teachers college and the graduate programs where long before they were admitted to the Columbia College. Um, the college, you know, I graduated from Columbia College in 1963, just on the begin, just before the uh, uprisings that uh, Mark Barksdale was talking about. Um, I think there was like one black student in my class. There were about 700 men in my class. There were no women, and there was one black student. This is 1963, and I'm not talking about the University of Mississippi here. We were in New York City. And yet the college was a totally closed community. They, for a long time, they wouldn't allow Jewish students in, or if they did, you know, Columbia had a little satellite campus in Brooklyn where Jewish students would sort of be sent for a year or two to, um, I don't know, make them more waspy in some way or another. <laughs> and then uh, they would come for two years at Columbia. So in other words, there was a long, long tradition of this. And remember, I mean, to my mind, this is going off the point, but I'm gonna stop after this. One of the Columbia's most terrible liabilities in the 20th century was basically that Nicholas Murray Butler lived too long. He was president of Columbia for like 45 years, you know, 1900 to 1945. And um, that's much too long. He, it, was a, it was run as a personal fiefdom uh, while other universities were sort of becoming bureaucratized and having more professional leadership. Maybe that's not so good in some ways, but uh, you know, Butler just, World War I, he just fired professors who opposed American involvement in World War I. So, um, you know, probably Nicholas Murray Butler didn't want black undergraduates around, and there was no one to uh, tell him that, uh, <laughs> that this was not a good policy. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's an interesting thing. And even, you know, even by the late 60s, there were very few African-American students in Columbia College. The significant rise in numbers came in the 70s, 80s, et cetera. Yeah, as a result of uh, Dr. King's uh, assassination. And that, yeah. uh, and that even, you know, even before um, 1954's uh, Brown versus Board of Education decision by the Supreme Court, you know, segregation laws were still very much enforced in the United States. And so Columbia, University was no different than any other institution in the United States in terms of, you know, preventing black students from. from oh, attending. yeah, very much so. Although <laughs> it wasn't a law here in New York, it was Columbia's own decision. Right. Uh, in, in Alabama, it was the state law. In, uh, in, in New York State, there was no such law, but segregation existed anyway, as you said. Yes, exactly. Yeah, just to echo what Mark is saying, and also, at the medical school, there were, might have been some, but there weren't many. It was really one or two black students a year until after 1970, when the American Association of Medical Colleges decided that they would go for uh, population parity and instituted a program. And then Columbia got in line after that. So I, when I started in 1974, there were uh, seven black students in my class. So that was more than the one or two. but. Mm -hmm the numbers were not substantial. And still to this day, the number of, of minority medical students are very low. 
uh, in the world, in, in the American mm -hmm. world. But it all happened as a result of Dr. King's assassination where the university decided to have a, this conversation with itself and decided to open up uh, its enrollment and admissions process to, to be more diverse, let's put it that way. Well, and it's possible, not that that's not a, a terrible moment, but it, it comes in a decade of, of, of 15 years, right? Dr. King starts the Montgomery bus boycott or is part of starting the Montgomery bus boycott, December 1st, 1955. So there's been an arc of this organizing all around the country. So and we don't want to, we don't want to isolate that moment. No, but it, that the, his assassination was, was a catalytic event that really similar, you know, to George Floyd's death, uh, um, in, in May this year that just sparked a lot of, uh, changes among, uh, uh institutions in, within the United States. Or it's like the forest fires where a spark fell in a, in yes. a system that was ready to burn. Yes. Well, um, Thank you very much. Uh, I think that it, these are grave things, and uh, it's been uh, there's a lot there's a lot of work to do, obviously, in uh, in mending our histories and mending um, and, and bringing uh, more um, love into the uh, into the politics and politics uh, in making politics a, a, a more um, harmonious and welcoming environment for all. I, I thank you um, very much in the name of the students. Uh, please know that this is something that the students, a conversation that the students requested to have and something that may continue in the classroom. And we thank you and we may come back to you with more thoughts in the near future. Thank you so much for today. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you.